I'm going to introduce our speaker while he's getting set up because he was once a student just like you. Bob Marshall graduated with an engineering degree here. He's actually been a speaker for us before, but when I looked it up, it was 2007. It's way too long since we've invited you back, Bob. Sounds like I want my idea. No, but in the meantime, he's been busy. When you were here, you talked about weather bugs, that business. Yeah, that business. I'll talk about that business. You've, still, you've started some others. Yep, you've started some sort of others. He's now got a new one called Whisker Labs. So my point is that the, the topic today is common mistakes and pitfalls when starting a business. We have a serial entrepreneur here who has probably encountered some pitfalls, probably made some All mistakes, kinds of and probably done some things right too. There's lots of wrong things. Yeah, so why we bring them in is to talk to you candidly. Everybody has this glorious you know, picture of what an entrepreneur does, what it's like. It's hard work. It's hard work, it's unpredictable work, but it's really rewarding work. So Bob, it is all yours. Welcome back to campus. It's so good Great. to see you again. Hey, Let's welcome it. Thanks everybody. Um, look, while we're getting uh, the, the machine hooked up, I got a few slides. Uh, I would just love to hear, so look, I'm an 88 graduate, mechanical engineering. Back in those days, uh, the College of Engineering wasn't actually the UMBC College of Engineering, it was the University of Maryland College Park College of Engineering, but we had a satellite campus here, so I took my classes here except for a couple. College Park graduated in 1988, uh, went off and did some, uh, actually I met, so just to give you a little bit of my journey, um, So just to give you a little bit, uh, so I, I had no idea I was going to be an entrepreneur, I can tell you that. So you guys are already way ahead of me if you're thinking about it at this stage, because I had no idea that, that I would do anything like I did. Um, uh, but I did, you know, during school, I started uh, a co-op uh, program uh, with a company here that did uh, defense work up in Hartford County, actually. And it was a very small company, so I was fortunate to get involved with a tiny company. Three or four people, when I walked in, I interviewed with the CEO, and he said, well, how you're in engineering. Um, I, I think I might have something for you, so why don't you come in in the summertime and work? And uh, he turned out to be a, a great mentor. He's a serial entrepreneur. And uh, worked there, saw that company grow from three or four people to 30 or 40 people over the course of my college career. Um, he said, look, we're going to um, uh, come back he said, we're gonna start a new business. He liked kind of what I was doing. He said, one of these days we'll start a new business. Uh, but you know, what he was doing wasn't really technical, so I went off, uh, I wanted to do something really cool technical first, so I went off and worked at a company called BBN, uh, both Veronica and Newman. You guys have never heard of them, but believe it or not, they are the company that started the internet uh, back in the 70s with the DARPA contract, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. That, so they are up in Cambridge, Mass, a bunch of MIT grads. Uh, and I actually did uh, really cool sensor and signal processing uh, work at BBM. Did anti-submarine warfare, that was back during the Cold War, so we were dropping sensors in the ocean, collecting tons of data, and trying to find submarines, which I, was really cool technical engineering work, and I learned a lot from a, a ton of very smart people on sensors and data. Um, and you know, when you look at what we're doing today and what I've done throughout my career, everything is around sensors and data. Um, and you know, there's a ton of opportunity. So IoT is a big word, right, uh, today, today. And it has been for many years, but IoT, I've kind of done IoT um, before it was ever called IoT. We connected sensors to the internet, uh, collected massive amounts of data, and, um, and uh, tried to turn it into intelligence and produce products and services around the data. Um, so, but I'm gonna take you through a little bit of my background, but I would just love to go around real quick, just real quick, what's everybody studied? What year are you, what's that? We'll start right here. Uh, biochemistry. Biochemistry? Biology? Senior information systems. Okay, cool. Which side? Management of aging services. Awesome. 
Yeah. We'll start right now. Uh, Senior Information Systems. Uh, recent grad, uh, biochemistry. Uh, junior Information Systems is like. Okay. Junior Biology. So we, we got a really broad background, it sounds like, right? I mean, a lot of different uh, backgrounds. It had, uh, you know, so it sounds like you have some interest in entrepreneurship, and I'll, I'll take you through my journey here, and feel free to stop, stop me anytime if you have any questions. So we'll talk about some pitfalls. But I also might challenge you all, uh, I'm gonna give you a quiz to uh, at, come up with kind of the five key things that, that are important in making any business a success, in my opinion. So I'm gonna ask you to, um, I don't know if we can get it up on the screen or not, but if, if not, we'll just talk about it. I wanna hear what you guys think. But I'll tell you, you know, how, we, how I got started and, and the companies that I've been involved with, fortunate to be involved with, so. Um, so my wife, who is a UMBC mathematics graduate in 1990, uh, I met here. Uh, she gets the credit for the first company, actually. Uh, so she is a mathematics teacher. She te teaches calculus, high school calculus, who is middle school you know, middle school algebra and things. Back when we first got married, and uh, my uh, came up with this crazy idea of you know I had done submarine sensors, and, and but I loved weather, and so I said well you know, why don't we make a weather station? Um, and, you know, a weather station, but you kind of look around, if you want to start a business, and, you know, what, you, what, are, what are you gonna do that's unique, right? And, well, weather stations were not unique. I mean, there's dozens of companies that make some kind of weather station. Um, uh, but at the time, the internet was just starting, and nobody was networking the sensors. So I thought, well, you know, we're gonna make a connected weather station. That, that didn't really exist at that time. And my wife was teaching middle school math and she said, well, I would love to have a weather station at my school. Uh, she, you know, I could get the data from the weather station and then I would make my classroom lessons much more interesting and engaging for the students um, you know, uh, to make math and science more real using the weather data from the weather station. And we would network all these things so the schools could share the data. Well, I mean, that was an idea. And it sounded like a good idea. Nobody was doing that. So we literally set up a company to sell weather stations uh, to school. Thank you. Uh, sell weather stations to schools. And this, uh, get past that. Um, and the company was called uh, Automated Weather Source, uh, AWS. Um, and again, the sole purpose of that company was, you know, we thought it was a really cool idea that We'd have a product, weather stations, put them in schools, sell them to schools, they'd use the data for math and science, we'd network the data, they could share the data, a network of sensors would grow, and eventually we thought that data could be valuable for some purpose, uh, we didn't know for what. But you know, sensor networks are always very valuable. So that's the first company that we started. And you know, so, so the idea, it's unique, nobody else was doing it some unique kind of technology in terms of networking sensors. So those things were kind of behind it. And then there's always a mark, you know, a go-to-market challenge. How do you how do you sell things? You know, if you're gonna have a business, you gotta generate revenue and sell things. And you know, am I gonna drive around in my car and put my weather station in the trunk and go to the top of the principal and see if they're gonna buy it? That didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, wouldn't scale. Uh, so we came up with the idea that we would um, uh, work with TV stations. Uh, so we would provide the data to TV stations so that they could, you know, the meteorologists on TV could show the data from the local community schools rather than telling you what the temperature is at BWI, right? Well, that turned out to be a great idea. And the TV stations loved it. And then they became our marketing arm. So, you know, when, when the meteorologists on WBAL, uh, Tom Tassemeyer, and I still remember the names in the <laughs> call letters from all those years, you know, when Tom, you know, shows the data from North School, Sure enough, South School said, well, why aren't we on TV? Now that's, it wouldn't work today because nobody watches you know, local news anymore. But, uh, anyway, so this network grew and grew to become the largest weather uh, network in the world. Thousands and thousands of sensors across the country. 
and we, you know, uh, then you're looking to grow. Um, and, you know, so we changed the name of the company. We wanted to expand into other sensors and other applications. So we changed the name of the company from Automated Weather Source to AWS Convergence Technologies. Uh, we expanded the sensor network to include cameras. Um, we ultimately expanded it. Oh, I'm gonna do next. So then our, our CTO, uh, so obviously you're hiring people along the way. People are hugely important, right, to, to success and the team, uh, and the internet was really kicking up and apps were getting important. So our CTO said, well, why don't we create an app um, that puts the, you know, this is, you know, on the PC tray back in the day, put the temperature next to the clock down on your tray in the, in the Windows uh, thing. And we're like, well, that, that sounds like a pretty cool idea. What if that would be popular? Well, geez, that, that, went, that went absolutely crazy. So on the desktop, uh, we created a weather, we created a brand, Weatherbug. It is a completely different kind of business. So a challenge, a huge challenge was this business, these businesses were uh, creating sensor networks, collecting data, and selling data. It was an, a media business, really a digital media business. You're selling apps, selling advertising to, you know, it's free to the customers. Um, so Weatherbug today, if you have it on your phone, many of you do, uh, probably if you don't download, it's free. I, I'm not involved in it anymore, but it's been downloaded on the desktop or the mobile phone probably 150 million times or 200 million times. I don't know. It's, and you know, there's 15 million or 20 million people that use it every day or so now. So that, um, but that was a very different business. So from a management and growth perspective, it was very different. These are two different things, which is a challenge because they're different kind of people, different kind of talent uh, to manage those two different types of businesses. This business, you know, when, it, when the transition from uh, the, the web and the desktop to mobile phones was happening, created a huge challenge for a lot of websites. Um, huge headwinds, the advertising market cratered and, you know, it's just a mess. Um, then we kind of stagnated, the growth stagnated, which was difficult. Um, and, you know, we kind of, we didn't do anything with that. We kept it going, managed it through very, very difficult times. It's actually doing extraordinarily well now. But, you know, we got back to our roots um, and we changed the name of the core company to Earth Networks. And we deployed uh, the largest network of greenhouse gas sensors in the world. So climate, obviously, is super important, huge problem for society. And I didn't realize that there was not many um, CO2 sensors out there. Um, and, you know, the Mauna Loa record, Dr. Keeling from Scripps, uh, is world famous for that record. It is the standard by which all climate scientists use today. That is actually, that station at the top of Mauna Loa is actually run by Earth Networks now. So we partnered with the Scripps Institute of Oceanography and Dr. Keeling, uh, and we've deployed, and I say we, I'm not associated with Earth Networks anymore either. We ended up selling this, we've sold this. Uh, but Earth Networks operates the largest um, network of greenhouse gas sensors uh, in the world, uh, with NOAA and NASA and other things. So we, this is a data business. We sold data to like NASA and NOAA, the National Weather Service, like the National Football League, Major League Baseball, Walt Disney, all the big companies that, you know, weather and climate was important for their safety of their customers, things like that. They needed granular, high resolution data. These were data businesses. This was a digital media business, okay? Um, and let's see, what did we, and any questions, by the way, fire away uh, on anything. Uh, then we um, spun out a new company um, back in, well, we, so again, and this is, we're gonna come around to kind of pitfalls and what works and what doesn't work and what's important. Um, in my career, our, our most core competency, most core competency is sensors and data. Sensors and data. We do that better than anybody else in the world. Uh, we did here, 
and we're looking for ways to grow because weather and climate it turns out is a very tough business <laughs> there's just a lot of people in the weather and climate business and it is it, it was growing um, and the revenue is growing we're hiring people a little profitable you know but difficult to grow at a huge pace and we've got investors i'll talk about investors here in a minute we've got investors along the way uh, through this journey and then one of the networks that we created here was a global lightning detection network so uh, lightning is super important for a lot of people uh, so we had sensors all around the world that measured the electromagnetic pulse of energy. When there's a lightning flash, there's a pulse of energy that goes out across the planet, and our sensors would measure that, and you know, and measure the time that it arrives. If you do stuff at very high speeds and with huge precision, you can then locate where the lightning occurs within 100 meters or so. And so we that data. NASA uses that data today. They don't launch a rocket from Cape Canaveral or anywhere else unless they check the Earth Network's lightning data to make sure that the atmosphere uh, is okay uh, for that. NASA, uh, NOAA uses the data for storm warnings and everything else. So, and then there's some serendipity involved for how we get here. Uh, my, uh, as I said, my wife, uh, UMBC grad, her sister's house, believe it or not, burned down. She lives in Ellicott City, not far, 15 minutes from here. Uh, burned down uh, in 2015 or 16 or something. Terrible event. They lost a pet. Uh, none of the family died, but they lost everything. Um, and it was an electrical fire that caused it. I didn't know anything about electrical fires at all at that time. Uh, but kind of looked at what causes them, and it turns out it's, it's loose connections and damaged wires inside of walls and inside of things plugged in in your house that arc. So a loose connection, electricity will arc. Uh, and that an arc is essentially the temperature of the sun. Uh, so it's super hot and that can happen when nobody's home. It can happen when you're sleeping. Um, and so, so I said, well, lightning is an arc. I mean, this lightning, lightning is a big arc, right? It's a big electrical arc between the cloud and ground. So I said, well, why can't we, you know, I challenged our chief scientist, who's an MIT PhD, I said, why can't we miniaturize our lightning detection sensors and create a product that would prevent electrical fires? Um, so that was the genesis of this idea. Uh, and that was gonna be a different business, which is somewhat challenging. Uh, so we did a Skunk Works project inside of Earth Networks, and myself, and this had gotten big enough, you know, that I was, I hired a chief operating officer, ultimately made that person the chief executive officer. And we went off into a, a lab, essentially, and, and a Skunk Works project to try to figure out whether we could change our lightning sensors to become sensors that you could use in a home to prevent electrical fires. Well, that turned out to be way, way, way harder than we thought. I mean, we spent two years trying to figure this out and it looked literally impossible. It looked like we were on the wrong side of the impossible line in terms of being able to create a product to do this. And eventually we had a breakthrough that we figured out we could find the signal and the noise. These tiny little arcs that happen inside of walls in a home they create tiny little signals. In the home's electrical network, it's very complex. You got all these circuits come back to the panel, and how do you do that? Uh, well, eventually we figured it out technically that we could do it. Um, and and then you know how do you how are we going to go to market with that? It didn't fit with weather and climate, so we spun out a new company out of Earth Networks. We funded this. You know, we put fifteen million dollars from Earth Networks into. Worcester Labs just to get it going. Um, and we had already uh, spent a couple of years with top, you know, our, my, and I was able to, don't tell me for this, take all the best people. I knew they were this. Because this is a big, this, this, you know, this was a good business for sure. It grew, but the opportunity was somewhat limited. This one's very big. There's 50,000 electrical fires every year. It's billions of dollars in damage. Uh, it 
is thousands of lives impacted. It is 10 times that globally or more. Um, and there is no other product remotely close to this. So we set up Whisker Labs as a new company in 2017. And, you know, uh, you know, how do you go to market? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna sell this product? Uh, and the product, by the way, which I'll, well, I'll show you. I'll, I'll show you what we did. And I'll pause real quick if there's any questions. It's a little complicated how all this came together. So, yeah. Uh, any so, question is good, too. So, you know, I can understand from up until the point where you're at Whisker Labs, why you named everything what you did. Why did you name it Whisker Labs? Yeah, so, yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, we do, we're doing remote sensing. So, look, you're, you're sitting around in a happy hour having a beer after work. What the hell are we going to call this thing? <laughs> right? And, and, well, what, you know, what kind of makes sense? Uh, and... Um, and you know, so animals use their whiskers to sense things remotely, right? So our sensor, you know, while it's plugged into one outlet in a home, uh, senses remotely everything going on in the house. So we came up with Whisker Labs. It's as simple as that. Now the business model is such that we don't we don't really care to be honest with you about this brand because uh, the way the, our business model that we set up it's this brand our product brand that is important. We elected not to sell. So you think about what, and this is the product by the way. So, and that, one of the things that is so, so important I think is the simplicity and elegance of the product. It, it has to be easy. I am just huge on, you know, the, it's got to be simple for the customer to use and elegant. So we spent a lot of time making this, you know, it, it looks simple, it is simple for the customer, but this, this product samples the electricity 30 million times every second. We do advanced machine learning and artificial intelligence on the device. We're collecting six gigabytes of data per second from the sensor fleet. We do more machine learning and, and artificial intelligence in the cloud, so it is super sophisticated. But the customers don't know any of that. It just detects arcing and prevents fires. Right, that's all that matters. So um, I think I might actually have this. Um, yeah, I'm going to show a couple slides here. But yeah, so so Ting, <laughs> Ting was definitely a happy hour discussion. We were like, what the hell are we going to call this product that have been successful, uh, that are commercial electronic kind of products, uh, are Nest, right? They did the thermostat. Google bought them for three and a half billion, uh, and Ring. That did the doorbell camera, and now they do a bunch of other stuff. But Amazon bought them for 1.2 billion, right? And we, it turns out that Ting uh, means is in Chinese is listen. So we're listening to the electrical network of the home to detect problems in the home. And it was available. Amazon came after us a little bit, but we got through that. They tried to say we're violating Ring, but uh, but it's a very different thing. So it's, you know, it's what's short, quick, easy to understand uh, that people will remember. Um, so this thing, the beauty again is it, it just simply, I mean, there would have been fatalities. We're in 220,000 homes now. We're shipping 30 to 50,000 uh, things a month. It is not, we don't actually sell hardware. It's a service that we provide. It's about the data and the service, not the hardware. Um, and, you know, the, the opportunity here is um, is really amazing. Uh, one single ting monitors the whole house. You can think of it, you know, vision-wise, like a Fitbit or a, you know, a uh, what's the new one? Whoop. Right? I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna whoop. It's like a whoop for the home, right? One sensor that monitors the thing to, to keep the the health of the home, whereas you know the Fitbit and Apple Watch and those things are monitoring your your health of your body, right? But, uh, so we monitor the home, we prevent fires, but then the network of things incredibly, sees incredible precision of what's going on with the power delivery from the utilities. And nobody has that information either. Um, so 
Yeah, it's amazing. The grid, right, is, you know, with the electrification of society and the need for solar and wind and storage and EVs and all that kind of stuff, the grid is hugely challenged. I mean, it is not, it wasn't designed to handle what we're doing. But if you don't, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, right? The utilities do not have data to understand where the grid is messed up. We're detecting problems in the West we're working now closely with PG&E and Southern California Edison, the utilities in California, they've started a bunch of the wildfires that have been so devastating. It's the problems on the grid. So, so anyway, so this is, um, you know, our go-to-market. So, let's see. Uh, so we elected, I'll talk about the go-to-market here real quick. Uh, and then I'll be trying to set the time. Okay, so we have more we'll wrap up here in a little bit. Um, you know, we, you know, so Nest went direct to the consumer. They sold thermostats, they bought a ton of advertising, they spent $100 million in advertising, created the brand, and were very successful. Ring did the same. They spent, you know, $100 million in advertising, and, and Ring was selling 20,000 doorbell cameras a month when they sold to Amazon for $1.2 billion. But then there's a hundred companies that have failed trying to do what Nest and Ring did. That is a very, very hard model to create a consumer electronics product, create a brand, and convince people, com consumers, to buy it, right, to buy it. Again, Nest and Ring were very successful. There's a couple others, but there's littered with failures across the board. Um, so we said, we didn't want to do that. We were capital constrained. So we're, our business model at Whisker Labs is B to B to C. So it's business to business to consumer. So we elected to partner with the insurance companies, okay? Because the insurance companies care, right? They're the ones that spend all the money to replace the house that burned down from the electrical fire, right? So this is a State Farm press release from just the other day, February 15th, last week, right? that they're deploying more than one million free tanks to their customers in the next year or so. Uh, they give it away free to every customer that wants it. So they pay for everything. They pay for the device, they pay for the service, and we save them more money than the cost of the service that we provide at State Farm. So, uh, so we launched with Nation. I was at Nationwide Headquarters a couple weeks ago. Your insurance, Liberty Mutual Insurance, are way behind State Farm. Uh, and this, I'll play a quick video here because you're like, you may not be able to hear that on, on the speaker or not, but this is, uh, this was, we just released this yesterday um, from the State Farm CEO. He rarely speaks in public and almost never mentions another company name besides uh, State Farm. Now, State Farm has a long history of finding other ways beyond just the repair of the building. And, and a couple that I point to we had a powerful relationship um, with Whisker Labs. It's, an, it's a device that you can put in your home that can detect electric arcs within the home. So you can prevent the fires from happening. Incredible, incredibly powerful consequence if you can actually prevent them. Yeah, so it's, so it's hard. You know, so State Farm, that brand, right? The Super Bowl at State Farm Stadium and Jake. And I mean, they, they're going to do a Jake commercial. It's only a question of how fast. We can't support it if we grew it that fast. By the way, we are hiring. We've hired a couple of university grads. We're hiring probably 40 or 50 engineers this year. So, and other technically any kind of STEM degree, our fire safety team that works with our customers to prevent fires. So, be in touch if you are looking for something. So, um, but yeah. So this, you know, this, this, this grows. So we're, we're in a little over 200,000 homes right now, but you know, we're gonna be in a million homes in a year or so. And so, and so again, Ring sold selling 20,000 a month. And that was no recurring revenue. Recurring revenue is really important. Selling hardware is a terrible business. You don't wanna be in the hardware business. We're not in the hardware business. We, we are, because we have to produce hardware. We have to deal with supply chain challenges and stuff like that, which are a nightmare. But it's about the data. It's not about the hardware. It's about the service and the data, right? That's what's valuable, not, the sensor is actually very simple. It's the software that's in it. 
Um, so, and our vision for sure is that this, you know, this network that we're creating is going to be the most valuable, consequential IoT network that's ever been created. Because it's not just an individual home. We're monitoring the grid. We're seeing everything going on, you know, to, to do good inside of the home and you know, for community. So, so what I thought we would do, and then I'll tell you my, after that crazy journey, um, what do you all think What, what are keys to success? What are the, some of the, I, I referenced a couple challenges along the way, if you, and I might not have said them very specifically, but there's definitely, and I don't think we're gonna have time to break into groups. I thought about breaking into groups, so I'm just gonna. So, we won't do groups. Keys, keys to success and challenges, let's just have an open discussion. I would say for, when you guys had weather bug, it was consistency, so we kind of plateaued for a little bit. So you guys were able to make it out, so you have to be consistent with what you guys are doing in order to do so. Oops. All right. So I'm just going to jot them down, and then I'm going to bring up my, uh, my afterwards. So let's keep talking. What else? Uh, I would say innovation. Seeing or predicting, so let's see. Uh, uh, what's, what's one word I'm going to call that? Uh, forecast? Yeah, forecast, vision, or something. And uh, by the way, there are no right or wrong answers here. So, I mean, we're, uh, we're just having a discussion, and, and probably what I put up is not going to be accurate either. So, yeah. Listening to your customers? Listening to your customers is, is something I always do. Simplicity of design. Simplicity. Good. These are all good. I thought about the. So here's what I came up with. So, again, these are. Uh, and, and so a lot of the ideas. Uh, um, a lot of the ideas. Uh, go back to what you all talked about. Um, so definitely. I'm going to use a different word than consistency because I think that captures a lot of. Um, uh, I'll use my word a little later, but I think that's good. Innovation, clearly, I think is huge. I mean, you have to, you, you definitely have to innovate, right? I mean, 
I mean, you can have a successful small business, and there's lots of small business opportunities where you can, you know, set up a business and be successful and, and have other people that do similar things. You're just doing it better and, and serving your customers better, and that can be super valuable, right? But in a technology space, I don't think that works all that well. I mean, you, you want to do something that is unique and innovative and different um, that is certainly, hopefully, not something that somebody else has done, but then even more important, We've tried to do stuff, and I don't know that this is a good thing or not. We've tried to do things that are very, very hard, very hard and very difficult for um, for people to replicate and do. Uh, now that brings its own challenges too, because it requires more investment sometimes. You're, you're risking capital trying to do something that is very, very hard. Um, so go to market. Uh, Forecast and vision, I, I kind of put those together a little bit. Um, I think this is universal. I think this is like, listen to customers. I mean, clearly, you got to listen to customers and, and deliver value to the customers, right? And, you know, look, I mean, one thing, you, know, you listen to that quote from the State Farm CEO, right? I mean, we absolutely know what matters to State Farm. I mean, it, I mean they, you know, it is not a bunch of BS when they say, they try to be a good neighbor at every level of that organization. They want to do what's right for their customers. Now they want to do it profitably. Isn't it? They run a good business, right? They don't want to, you know, so you, we, we have to make the economics work. If they want to do right by their customers and they listen to their customers, then we listen to them too. So we're actually an extension of their brand. We have to understand that homeowner and make sure we're delivering value to the homeowner and we have to deliver value to State Farm or Nationwide or Liberty Mutual. Uh, the forecast and the vision, um, you know, the go to, uh, yeah, I was gonna say these things go together, right? How are you gonna go to market and how do you forecast what your business is gonna uh, be like? I would say in the prior businesses, um, it was, look, the only thing I think you'll appreciate, the only thing about a forecast, you know, when you do your business forecast, the only thing guaranteed to be true about your forecast is that it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And unfortunately, it's almost always wrong on the worst side. <laughs> You're always more optimistic uh, in what you project than what ends up being reality. Now, that's actually not necessarily the case in this Whisker Labs business because we've got a model that is just working and we can forecast pretty accurately. Uh, but generally, uh, it's been difficult um, to forecast. And, and you have to, I mean, I guess that goes to <laughs> list a little bit. So you will. In any business, you're going to miss your forecast. You're going to have challenges. You have to learn uh, and adapt uh, and figure out how to, to move and transition right? <laughs> to, to fix the current business or if there's a new opportunity. Um, I would say, you know, um, maybe goes to team a little bit. I mean, I would say, you know, when I look back at Earth Networks, um, you know, well, we, we definitely recognize that Weatherbug was a digital media business. Earth Networks is a data business. They're very different things. So we actually operated those really, even though they were under the Earth Networks company, um, they were operated as separate businesses. There were separate teams, separate management structures, totally different go-to-markets, different sales organizations, different marketing organizations. But that creates, <laughs> you know, that's like the opposite of simplicity. It's very complex. It was a complex business. Even within the Earth Networks, we had, when we were selling to schools, we were selling to government agencies, we were selling to golf courses, and selling to Walt Disney World, and selling to the NFL, and selling to airlines. Oh my gosh. Just painful, painful. I mean, it was, you know, it was an okay business, but hard to forecast, uh, hard to forecast, and hard to execute because it was complex. Um, it wasn't simple. Um, and, you know, uh, see what else is up here? Uh, so we'll definitely, the, the, the team, as you all, I mean, it, it is all about the team. I mean, if you don't have good people, I mean, it is, you're, you have no chance. You know, so when you set up a company, you know, uh, making sure that you start with a core group of people that you can trust, that are smart and can and are willing to take the risk and willing to do whatever it takes to drive and make the business succeed is 
super critical. And then as you grow, obviously it doesn't stop. You got you to keep hiring uh, really good people and make sure they understand what we're trying to accomplish and, and stay, uh, stay focused on the mission, right? Um, so I think these are all, any, anything else anybody wants to add or change before I talk about, uh, or any other questions before I jump into it? So uh, I'll tell you the ones that I came up with, and these are not necessarily the right either, right things. You know, so the idea itself uh, has got to be solid, and I actually want the go-to-market in here. I mean. It, it, it is of no value to have a, an idea that doesn't have a market, right? Um, and and figuring out whether you have a market fit is not a trivial exercise. I mean, you can have some awesome technology, um, but you know, our people, our customer is going to buy it, and, and and buy it at scale. I mean, you have to go. You, know, as you said, listen to the customer as well. Whoever you're selling to, whether it's a business or a consumer. You got to listen to them and understand what their needs are, right? And make sure that that idea, that product, is going to fit with them, and they're going to be willing to buy it. And I think that's a really hard thing for somebody starting a business because you've got an idea, and obviously it's the best idea ever. It always is, right? Everybody should want to buy this thing, <laughs> and and that's often not the case. <laughs> so you better you better think about it. You better talk to your prospective customers early on and make sure that they agree that this is something that they would buy. And not just that they might like, might buy it, I mean, are they gonna buy it, right? I mean, that's a different thing, you know, when you do the research on that. Um, so, people, we just talked about it, right? I mean, it's, uh, I've got a core group of, again, I kind of stole the best of the best from Earth Networks over to Whisker Labs. You know, these are people, our, my co-founder and CTO, I've worked with since 1993, not long after graduating from UMBC. I mean, we just know each other so well, and I don't, we don't have to talk much, but it's, you know, it's, he, he's our CTO, so I prefer him never to come out of his office. <laughs> you know, so, um, uh, and he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't go out and talk to customers much. He's, he's coding and helping his team. I know our VP, our senior VP of operations uh, was on campus with me recruiting now she uh, started out as a young Virginia Tech grad at Earth Network. She's worked with us for 24 years. She's just fantastic people. I mean, she just knows people. She knows how to manage people. Um, is totally committed. Um, and our, you know, just uh, as the company grows, you know, you kind of you know, do, uh, you know, the financial administrative stuff is, you know, secondary in the early days, but. We just hired a CFO, Chief Financial Officer, at Whisker Labs for the first time. They used a consultant, you know, various things to you know, cobble it together early on. Um, I hired a CFO a couple of years, best hire I've ever had. He was just unbelievable. He was at Sprint Nextel. He did, the, you know, a lot of services businesses, and then he's done a number of startups, and he's just phenomenal. Um, so, you know, so people is super important. One thing we didn't talk much about is investors. Uh, so depending on the nature of the business, um, uh, you know, we've got, we've been very fortunate. Uh, I think we've raised between the multiple companies probably 60 or 70, 80 million dollars or something like that. Um, and our investors are just the best. And that's not always the case. I mean, you can have some very, you know, particularly when you get into the venture, so if you're starting a business, you might often, uh, you know, go to friends and family first. You don't need a lot of money. You're trying to prove it out, create a product, understand, you know, you know, is there a market for this product that we're gonna uh, do? You can get you know, kind of friends and family money. It's a lot uh, easier. It's a lot less complicated. Uh, that, but then as you grow, you, you may get venture capital, right? And then it's very sophisticated, and very complicated. And and I think you know, there's a lot of money out there, a lot of venture capital money. Some of it's think the quality of the money uh, really matters um, and having you know people that are true partners and I can tell you Earth Networks I mean the outcomes when we sold Earth Networks and Weatherbug you know we probably sold for 120 million dollars or something and probably you know there, there's two pieces roughly or more but that's a mediocre to poor 
mediocre result at best for the investors. If you look at an IRR return, what was the return for that? Um, mediocre. It was okay. But they all also own a significant type of whisker halves. So they're all like unbelievably jacked now because this one could be a very, very big thing. Um, but, they're, but they stuck with us the whole time. Right, so I mean, my relationship with our investors and our board, um, you know, I don't control the company, right? I don't, I mean, I'm a my, you know, minority shareholder, so they, I'm at the, I work at the discretion of the board, and they can fire me anytime. Um, but I am super, I've always been super transparent with the board. You know, in our board meetings, it is, I mean, it is the good, the bad, and the ugly, whatever it is, right? I am letting them know what's working, what's not working, and being super transparent, and that's resulted in, in investors that really work closely, trust me, trust our team to, um, to do what's right, and in the interest of the investors. Uh, so, yeah, and there's horror stories you hear, right? If you get a wrong investor and they really try to run your business and, and, and force you to do things you want to do. I think my single biggest lesson that I've learned over all that, that kind of crazy path is focus. At Earth Networks, um, we had a lot of small businesses within a business. You know, we had we always had a new idea. You know, we could sell data to this, this, you know, golf courses or NASA or whatever. And it's just complicated. And you know, and doing too many things is is not something that helps you grow. So we had Whisker Labs, I'm getting pinged all the time, all the time. You know, when are we gonna bring Ting to commercial buildings and commercial infrastructure? It doubles, triples the size of our market. I'm just saying no, 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 no. Yes, it will work, there's no question it will work. Uh, I'm getting Ting from Europe and South America and Asia. I mean, when can we have Ting in our country? No question, there's no technical risk. It absolutely will work. Um, and I'm saying no, no, no. I'm saying no to everything. Because, I mean, we don't have to do anything else. We just have to execute and we can grow to a you know, multi-billion dollar company. Now, there is a time when it makes sense to do commercial and, and go global, but uh, we're trying to say no. And I think Buffett said, you know, successful people say no often. Real successful people say no all the time. So I'm trying to say no all the time to all the potential opportunities. I mean, well, geez, can we can we can we use Ting data for this or can we use Ting for this? And yet, yeah, technically, the answer is yes, but no, because then you're taking attention from your senior team, from your engineers, and it's hard enough to execute selling fifty thousand, you know, not selling, yeah, moving fifty thousand Ting a month. I mean, what we can't do is screw up and mess up for State Farm or Liberty Mutual or Nationwide or our customers, number one, right? I mean, we can't prevent all fires, but all that matters is just stay focused and keep executing and hire good people and make sure that it works, right? So, and the last one, um, and, and it may be my only real quality, I think. In the end. Uh, I know, a, you know, a lot about nothing or nothing about a lot, whatever that is. Uh, but I am, uh, I persevere and uh, refuse to give up for sure. Uh, so, and that, I can assure you that no, no matter, Whisker Labs, I, I'm not going to have time to get into it. Um, yeah, you guys got to get to class for sure. Should have been dead. I mean, four years ago, we should have died. We had no money. We were, uh, we should have died. There's no reason we should be alive. But somehow we navigated a bunch of, problems and got the product to where it is today and now we're going like crazy so I know we've had some questions but let's I'm going to completely open it up. And before we do that I know you say no a lot but thank you say, for saying yes to us. It's a pleasure to have you back on campus. Yeah, it's well you've done time. a lot since 2007 <laughs> yeah, when you were last here. Yeah, so I'm a, you make us proud. Well, See this is what retrievers do. You make us proud. So thank you so much. Yeah, I really well. really appreciate it.